Well, good morning and welcome to the St. Andrew's Sanctuary. Welcome home. Would you join me in prayer? Lord Jesus, the parables are a gift that you give to us as we seek to follow you. Because the parables give us a window to step into and to see ourselves in these stories. And they're also, they hold up a mirror to us, to our own lives, our motives and our actions, our needs and our places of brokenness. We've heard together the parable of the forgotten son this morning and we see ourselves. We see ourselves. And now as we consider, consider this together, we ask that your Holy Spirit would fill us with a sense of openness and wonder and renew in us an obedience to your will in our lives. Bless us as we consider this, your word together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Here is a little parable about hurt in families. There was a woman, a young mom, who tried to regularly carve out time for her parents. Busy with a job and kids and a house, attention for her parents often came at the cost of time for herself. And that's why she was so stunned by what happened at the shopping mall. The young mom and her mother were out shopping and they ran into an old friend and the woman remarked on how nice it was to see these two women out together for a day. The mother looked at her daughter and said, oh, she follows the purse. Now, to be sure, that mother did the kind of things that parents often do for their adult children. Special treats, restaurant meals, and so on. But that remark, oh, she follows the purse, that really stung. It hurt. It got remembered. And you know why? She was hurt because there was an accusation here, an accusation that she only showed up for what she could get out of her mother. She was hurt. Because if you make an effort for someone, you don't want to have that flung back in your face with a half-joking barb indicating that you're only doing what you're doing out of self-interest. And I think we all know what it is to be hurt by words, or to hurt others with our words, even when it's not intentional, even when it's accidental. It's downright dismaying how much damage can be done in a family or to a friendship with a very few ill-chosen words or ill-considered actions. This morning in the story of the prodigal son, it's a story full of hurtful words and hurtful actions a community broken, a family damaged. The damage is undone, and wholeness and health can only be restored when the father in the story chooses to sacrifice and chooses to suffer. Jesus tells this parable to describe to us the nature of God, our Heavenly Father, the Lord. Well, in this story, how does the attack on the parable begin? Well, it's when the younger son says, Give me my share of the inheritance. Give me mine. Well, that has a contemporary ring to it, doesn't it? Just goes to show you how little human nature changes over a couple thousand years. Give me mine. But here is worse than mere selfishness. By asking for his share of the estate now, while the father yet lives, the younger son is saying to his father, in effect, give me my share, I wish you were dead. I want what I want, I, I want what I'm going to get when you're dead, and you're not dead yet, but I want what's mine. It is the same thing as wishing his father to be dead. When Jesus told this parable, you can bet a gas went up from the crowd at these words from the son. And the people who heard Jesus speaking all could know for sure what was going to happen next in the story, that the father would strike his son across the face and drive him from the house and kick his backside every step of the way. This request, give me mine, this demand, is also an attack, not just on the father, but on the whole family. Because the father will have to 
sell off his assets to pay out to that younger son his share. Not only that, the father would have been humiliated before the entire community, humiliating for everyone to know what he had allowed his son to say to him, give me mine. To say, in effect, I don't want this life, I don't want this family, I don't want you, give me mine. Those hard words were an attack, a humiliating attack, on a family, on a community, and on a way of life. The younger son gets the money, and once he's got it, he goes and blows it all on wild living. Once it's gone, he comes to his senses. I love that. He comes to his senses and devises a plan to come home. Now it's time for the father, once the younger son returns, to endure a second attack on the family. And this time the attack comes from the older son. When the younger son does come home, the elder son stubbornly refuses to go in and join the celebration, the welcome home. You know how that older son feels, why he refuses, why he nurses his grievance, and why he mutters to himself, I'm the heir now. This whole operation is mine now. And that waster brother of mine, I won't welcome him. If he's in, I'm out. And that's the second attack on the family in this parable. In very distinct ways, these two sons have made attacks on the family, and that has fractured the community. They have disrespected the authority of their father, and they have tried to take away from their father the right to make decisions, decisions that are rightly his to make. What's tearing this family apart? Greed, selfishness, grasping at what's not yours? Sure, all of those. But I was reading Timothy Keller's book on this parable and he proposes that really what is tearing this family apart is idolatry. Now you know idolatry, it's making anything your God, that isn't the one true God. And here's Keller's argument about why what is wrong with this family is really idolatry. You see, the younger son has been part of the family. He's been living as a proper son for that day and age, which is to obey the wishes of the father. So when the younger son breaks the custom and asks for his share, what he really wants from his father is becoming clear. It's becoming evident that he didn't really love his father. He loved his father's wealth. He loved his father's possessions. He loved his father's land. All these years he's been playing the obedient son, faking it, waiting for the old guy to keel over so he can get what he's wanted all along. It sure has become evident. He never really loved his father. He loved what his father could give him. He never really loved his father, that younger son. He only loved what his father could give him. And that's why he says, give me my share now. If he really loved his father, and not just what his father could provide, he would never have been so heartless as to ask for his, chair, his share, and in effect, to wish his father dead. He didn't really want his father, he just wanted what his father could give him. He valued his father's wealth, what the father could provide, far more than he valued the father. You and me, do we love our Heavenly Father? Do we love the Lord? Or do we just want what God can give us? Do we have our hearts set on what the Father has? rather than having our hearts set on the Father. We're always asking God for things, for health, for help, for love, for good grades, better job. And if we get what we want, sometimes we even remember to be thankful. But the Lord God, Lord over heaven and earth, is not a spiritual ATM 
just there to be used as needed. When we love God primarily for what God can give us, rather than loving God because he is our father, we fall into the same kind of idolatry as that younger brother, wanting the father's things rather than the father because our hearts are set on the things all along. Well, let's take a minute and think about that older brother and his idolatry. When he hears that his younger brother is back, just think about the older brother's hurtful and react, rejecting reaction. And first, let's remember something. The day that younger boy came home was the happiest day of the father's life. He'd been out at the road watching and waiting for that boy to come home. And when he finally came, it was the happiest day of his life. Look at the celebration that he unleashed. The fatted calf, which was enough to feed a crowd of a hundred or more, the biggest feast the village had ever seen. Nothing was too good for this event, nothing too much trouble. Everyone in town was invited to share in the great joy, and you could hear the celebration from the back 40. And when that elder son came home, all he could see was that the father was spending his inheritance on things that he didn't approve of. See, there's the idolatry of the older brother. He loved his father, not for who his father is, but for what his father could give him, the inheritance that he was looking forward to. He wasn't loving his father for himself, but just what was in it for him. You see this in the way that he humiliates his father in front of the servants and the relatives and the whole neighborhood. When the older son refuses to come in, the father has to go out and plead with him and beg with him. That's humiliating. That older brother, he doesn't really love his father. It's as clear as day. What that older brother loves is not the father, but what the father can do for him, give to him, leave to him. That older brother is as much set on his father's things, his assets, as the younger brother is. And that's idolatry. It's loving our Heavenly Father only for what he can do for us rather than loving God for who God is, God's own self. Both of these sons, younger and elder, heart scalded their father. The younger one by sailing blithely off into immorality and waste, throwing away everything provided from the father's hand. And the elder brother, well, he scalded the father's heart by mulishly refusing to enter into the joy and celebration over the lost being found. It's not just those two boys. It's all of us. This is the mess we all get ourselves into when we love anything more than we love God. This is the kind of family-destroying and community-smashing messes we get ourselves into when we make anything that isn't God into an idol. In this parable, the younger son made an idol out of pleasure, the desires of the heart, out of independence and self-determination. He valued these above all. His desire to live life on its own terms to the ultimate with no concern for who gets hurt, that's his idolatry. And that idolatry put his very life at risk before he came to his senses and came home to his father. And that older son, he's worshipping a false god is just a different one. He's made an idol out of being right, of being justified, of being owed, of getting his just desserts. And this idol worship for that older brother will put his life at risk too because he is willing to sacrifice his relationship with the Father, the source of life, rather than suffer the indignity of forgiving and welcoming his brother. And all of us, we put our lives at the same kind of risk when we make an idol out of something, anything, that isn't God. When we value God for what God gives us rather than for who God is. It's idolatry. 
It hurts us. It makes us discontented and dissatisfied, and it destroys community with others. We're created, we're meant, we're destined to put God at the center of our lives. And when we do it, that's when we know joy and beauty and rest and peace and power. That's when we become free to say, I love you, Lord, not just for how you are useful in getting what I want. I love you, I serve you because of who you are in yourself. That's how the two sons failed the father in the parable. That's why what they deserved in the culture of the day was to have been beaten and cast out. Instead, though, in this story, the father doesn't strike his sons or throw them out. Instead, he takes the pain and he takes it to himself. He takes the pain of the son who walked away and departed to a far country. The father takes upon himself the pain of the son who stubbornly remained outside the family circle, refusing to come in and share the joy of the lost being found. The father in the parable took the pain of his sons and the sins of his sons, and he carried them. By his sacrifice, by his suffering, he redeemed the situation, and he redeemed his sons. And our Father, our Heavenly Father, how deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure that he takes our pain and our failing and our sin and our death, and he dies it for us, and he pays it for us. We were slaves, and he made us his sons and daughters. The beauty of all of this, the joy of this sacrifice, is powerful enough to help us come to our senses, to see the idolatry of worshiping anything but the Lord. The Father's sacrifice can and does restore us to our right minds and sets our feet on the path home and reminds us of how much we are to love one another and forgive one another. For the Father, our Father, is still waiting and looking down the road and watching for us to come home. Come home. Come home. Ye who are weary, come home. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, send our feet on that homeward path. Teach us to let go of that which is valueless and cling to the eternal. Open us to your heartfelt pleas for us to return home and help us to return home anew day after day after day for you are our Father and you watch for us. Bless us in the days ahead as we feed on your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.